Hey everyone, and if I'm not mistaken, this year 2025 is coming to a close, because my birthday is very near, and I'm pretty sure my birthday is at the end of the year, or thereabouts. Anyway, at the end of each year, we start looking at, is this the year of the Linux desktop? And while this will never be a thing, I think, we still have four big opportunities coming up in 2026 that could make Linux grow even bigger than it already did over the past few years. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video after this message from our sponsor, ProtonVPN. I'm not going to tell you what a VPN does because you all know about it. You've seen ads for plenty of VPNs. The one I use though personally is Proton VPN because it is fast, it is secure, it is fully encrypted, they don't log anything, and it's part of your entire Proton account, which gives you an email address, contacts, calendar, storage space, a password manager, and Proton VPN as well. It is fantastic. It has a Linux app, it has smartphones app, it works with virtually any device that you might want, and it is extremely good. And on top of that, currently you can get it with a nice Black Friday deal up to 70% off for their VPN Plus plan uh, for 12 month subscription or 50% off for the Proton Unlimited subscription, which gives you basically full service for every application and program that Proton gives you. They are really, really solid. I use Proton Mail, I use Proton Drive, I use Proton VPN, I even use Proton Pass. I really enjoy what they're doing. They're private, they're fast, they're secure. The link, as always, is down in the description. So what are those four big opportunities for Linux? The first one is the rise of AI, and not at all in the way that you're thinking. You all know I do not like how AI is being built right now, how most use cases are being implemented and pushed as being stable and ready solutions when they are absolutely 100% verifiably not ready for prime time. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people think like me and they do not like AI. The issue is AI is being crammed into Every other operating system, Apple is having a deal with Gemini, Google's AI, to implement their Apple intelligence stuff because the stuff they built themselves is absolutely atrocious. And Windows is obviously being fully revamped into what they call an agentic AI, which means you're going to be able to spawn little agents that do your work for you in a sort of half incompetent way that will not really save you any time and make people miserable at work, according to a bunch of studies. A lot of people do not like this direction at all. And these malcontents will not be able to go back to Windows 10 because it is end of life. They won't stick with Windows 11 because it's getting increasingly AI. They're not going to move to a potential future Windows 12 because it's going to be even more full of AI. And they're not going to move to macOS because they're cramming it full of AI as well. The only bastion that they can find is Linux. And Linux is going to greet them with arms wide open because a lot of distribution makers just do not want AI tools either. And most of those that think maybe it could be useful, they're implementing it on an opt-in basis for all features, meaning by default, you don't have that crap on your system. Now, it's come to the point where Windows is full of AI, but they're still giving you warnings that using AI could lead to theft, to malware, and is even inaccurate. I don't know about you, but if my OS keeps cramming features in my face, but they keep telling me that those features are inaccurate and unsafe, I am leaving through the door or maybe jumping through the windows in that case. Now that's the first thing about AI. The second one is also that paradoxically, AI is mostly being built using Linux. Most of the training, everything that happens in the background to power AI chatbots and AI tools, it's mostly done on Linux these days because Linux is virtually the only system you can really tailor to your specific needs. You can really size it down and keep all the resources and all the performance for those specific applications. Also, you don't really have to pay licenses to use it in most cases, so you can spin thousands of instances with millions of GPUs and keep training stuff on it. Meaning that most companies that are making the AI bubble close to bursting 
are using Linux and thus are contributing to Linux. NVIDIA, since they started focusing on AI, have been really much more Linux friendly. Their drivers have improved a thousandfold in the past few years. They are actively contributing to open source drivers. They turned into a sort of reasonable citizen for the Linux ecosystem. This is also a big opportunity because as more hardware is being turned to AI, more companies will want to tailor Linux to their needs and they'll contribute to it, they'll fix bugs, they'll implement new things, and they'll add support for what they built, which is good for everyone in general. And I know it is a bit hypocritical to praise Linux for being free of AI, and on the other hand, praise companies for using Linux for making said AI. But if you can't beat them, you can at least climb on their shoulders to be better. Now, our second big opportunity will be the Steam Machine. There is no debating that Valve knows how to make hardware that sells. Their first iterations weren't perfect, their first Steam Machines were a big flop, their first VR helmet was absolutely insanely priced, but now they're introducing the Steam Frame, the Steam Machine, off of the success of the Steam Deck, and this looks very interesting. First, because it is a console, but it is also a full-blown Linux PC. They even market it as being able to do all your PC computer stuff, meaning it's good because it will confront more and more people with actually using a Linux desktop. Some people will want to turn to that to maybe install a mod manager or install stuff that comes outside of Steam. Some people will use it in desktop mode plugged into a monitor. Some people will just want to use it to maybe, I don't know, cheat, install hacks or just use it as a regular computer. And that's more and more people that will be faced with a KDE desktop on a Linux distro with a Linux app store and Linux applications. And this means plenty of people will maybe be frustrated with that, but also Valve will kind of have to invest in supporting that Linux desktop, that Linux distro, and maybe even facilitating the installation of various programs. Generally, they could make the entire Linux desktop better. Now, this is not brand new. The Steam Deck already had a Linux desktop. They had SteamOS with a desktop mode with KDE. The thing is, I'm pretty sure that most people using the Steam Deck only entered desktop mode to try and install something that didn't come from Steam, like uh, the Decky Loader plugins and stuff like that. But they probably didn't use the Steam Deck as a full PC in most cases. They just used it as a handheld console. On the Steam Machine, though, you might really want to use it as a full-blown PC, and so more people will be faced with that desktop, which means Valve will have to invest. They previously invested mostly in the graphics department, the performance optimizations, the CPU side of things, but now they might also have to touch up the desktop. They did fund KDE quite a bit on certain features, but maybe this will continue, will improve, and this means a better desktop for everyone, more people confronted to that desktop, and that also means more Linux users in the long run. And the obvious thing is for gaming. Uh, editors, when they look at the Steam Deck, they can say, hey, this is not a competitive multiplayer machine. We don't care about implementing support for our anti-cheat tool for this handheld console. When they're gonna look at the Steam machine being used as a PC by most people, they're gonna have a harder time using that as an excuse. And if the Steam machine sells as well as the deck, maybe even better, I'm pretty sure that most developers will start thinking about solutions to bring their anti-cheat solutions to Linux. Now, whether these solutions are desirable or not, I leave it up to you. What it will likely mean is that more people will just be able to completely ditch Windows to play their competitive multiplayer games on Linux. I personally really do not like those sort of games, the competitive multiplayer shooter. If I wanted to face entitled, foul-mouthed and cheating teens, I would go back to teaching, probably, instead of playing those games. The thing is, many people do play those games and having them work on Linux would probably be a boon, because once you really don't have that anti-cheat barrier, you really do not need to stick with Windows any longer for gaming, because the performance is better on Linux in most cases, the OS is more stable, it's not riddled with ads, it's not stealing your data, you don't have driver update problems every single update for Windows, they don't force you to reboot anything, it's just a better experience all around. 
So again, a big opportunity for Linux desktop growth. Now the third one will be the cosmic desktop. And you might think it's just another desktop environment. Who cares? It's probably not going to grow anything apart maybe the community of people who don't use styling window managers anymore because cosmic does that just as well. Thing is, Cosmic is a bit different. First, because it is being made by a company that sells actual hardware that ships with Cosmic pre-installed, meaning they have a different incentive from pure community projects. KD and GNOME do focus on usability, they do focus on features for users, but Cosmic is being made by a company. If their customers are unhappy with the software that their laptops or desktops ship with, they're gonna regret their entire purchase instead of just saying, hey, you know what, Gnome and KDE, they suck, I don't want those, I'm going to move to something else. These guys paid actual money to get that, meaning System76 has a stronger incentive to actually address their problems, their bugs, and the missing features. KDE and Gnome do have the same incentives, but most of the work is being done by volunteers or people on a contract for another company, meaning it's not that easy to attribute specific features that you personally as a developer don't care about and that the company you work for doesn't care about either. Cosmic will have to fix those because if customers demand it, they're gonna have a financial incentive to fix that. The second benefit of Cosmic is that it's kind of brand new. It is a new desktop and people who might have had a bad experience in the past, maybe with GNOME or KDE, they didn't click with it, it didn't work for them, maybe it was 10 years ago and they didn't enjoy it, they're gonna have another opportunity to revisit Linux. Pop OS, when it was announced initially, uh, spilled a lot of ink over the internet. A lot of people talked about it, a lot of people tried it, even people who weren't specifically in the Linux sphere. The new Cosmic Desktop and the new Pop OS will probably do the same thing, because it is being highly regarded as an interesting and strong effort to push the Linux desktop. Meaning, this might attract people who bounced off of Linux, but might have a second chance to try it. It looks different, it has different features, it has a specific aesthetic that you might agree with or not, but it is a different way of doing things and people who bounced off of Linux might just come back to it. So that's a second chance and that's also, I think, a big opportunity for Linux desktop growth. And the final big opportunity, in my opinion, is basically the end of that Wayland transition. We've been stuck in Wayland limbo for I don't know, maybe around seven or eight years. Basically, when I started this channel eight years ago, we already started talking about major desktops starting the work towards Wayland. Now we're nearing 2026, and those desktops have completed that transition. What is missing from Wayland support is stuff that Wayland is missing. It's protocols that are either experimental, being worked on, being discussed, or will never be implemented because that's not what Wayland wants to do. Meaning those desktops, at least KDE and GNOME, but also Cosmic, which is Wayland only, those desktops have pretty much finished their entire Wayland transition. The toolkits, the compositors, they work, they're fine. They implemented all the features that exist. And so the work can now turn to adding more stuff. Instead of replicating stuff that already worked on X11, but in a smoother, safer, more interesting, and more evolutive manner, they're gonna be able to just invest that same time in actually building other things, in building maybe better apps, better backends for online accounts, uh, maybe a more stable experience, maybe building a new theme or new interface or new different settings for their desktops, more interesting stuff for the average people and for people who use Linux for a while and just want to see new features added. Again, that Wayland transition did not prevent GNOME and KDE from adding features. If you look at where GNOME was eight years ago and where it is now, it is miles better than it was. Same with KDE, Plasma 6, 6.4 uh, right now, 6.5, is actually fantastic. Those are great solutions. And other desktops that are starting to focusing on Wayland or maybe finishing up their own Wayland transitions have grown a lot as well. They haven't just done Wayland stuff. But this monopolized a lot of resources and a lot of people, and those people are now free to work on something else if they want. Same with tiling window managers that had to be rebuilt for Wayland. They are now ready for Wayland, and now they can start maybe building other things around that. 
This is also a big opportunity because right at the moment where we could get a big influx of people thanks to the Steam machine, thanks to the Cosmic Desktop, thanks to the rise of AI and people fleeing AI-based operating systems, well, this is the moment where we're going to start seeing more features implemented at the same time. So users will see that on Linux, you get free updates very often that don't really break your entire workflow or entire system, which is not something Windows or even macOS can say, because these are system destroyers with every single major update that they apply, especially Windows. People are going to realize that this is just a better place to be when you own a computer. That doesn't mean everyone will move to Linux. That doesn't mean everyone who tries Linux will stick with it. That doesn't automatically fix all the other problems that we can have on Linux, such as certain hardware support, such as the anti-cheat thing. If if the Steam machine isn't successful, this will still be a reality and the problem, the lack of specific applications that people might require, the fact that companies still won't let their employees use Linux instead of using Windows or Mac OS, these are still very real problems. But people on their own moving to Linux, they're gonna have more opportunity to do so, more reasons to do so, and a much better experience now if they do so than in the previous years. So these are, in my opinion, four major opportunities for the growth of Linux. The rise of AI making people just run away, the rise of the cosmic desktop, which is going to be another opportunity for people to try things, the Steam machine building a better PC with Valve support, with maybe maybe finding a solution for the anti-cheat problem, and also, of course, the fact that desktops are now a lot freer to invest time on features and applications. All of that makes Linux a fantastic place and offer very, very good perspectives for the future. Anyway, let me know down in the comments if you agree with these, if you disagree, if you see other strong opportunities for Linux growth. And in the meantime, I'll tell you about Tuxedo, our sponsor. If you've watched any of my videos for the past three years, you probably know what Tuxedo is. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux pre-installed. I only use their devices these days. All my gaming is done, well, apart from my Steam Deck, also on a Tuxedo Cube, which is a uh, small form factor gaming PC. I also use their Infinity Book Pro 16 for everything you see on this channel. I record on it, I edit on it, I publish on it, I write on it. It's my only laptop and my only workstation. They're really fantastic. They have a big, big amount of choice. I left a link for you down in the description so you can check them out, see what they offer. They're really cool. They really support Linux very well. They try to contribute to Linux as much as they can as well. They're a fantastic actor and they've been supporting me for a while. So yeah, link down in the description. Check them out if you need a new PC. Anyway, thank you all for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, you know where all the usual YouTube buttons, comment section, bell notification stuffy, you know what this all does. There are also plenty of links to support the show down in the description. Thank you all for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.